Good evening, everybody. We are live here for our Tuesday evening BE class. That's BE standing for Bible Exploration. Chance to open up your Bibles and explore the Word of God. See uh, if we can't put some creases in the binding of those Bibles and, and uh, do some study along the way. I see Renee Welch, excuse me, Renee Latsky as the first person to... Uh, to show up tonight. Good to see you, Renee. If some of the others of you, uh, I'm seeing some of your comments. If you want to chime in and say hello, you know how much I always appreciate that. But I'm glad you're here. We're just going to kind of uh, wait a couple of minutes here while we see who uh, who else might want to join us right at seven o'clock on a Tuesday evening. Hope you are doing well and your house hasn't blown away in the winds this evening. Uh, things are, are doing okay. I'm here at the church in my office, as you can see. Good evening to Connie Reynolds, good to see you. Connie played her violin for us at our Gather um, uh, small group event last Sunday. And um, that was a blessing to everybody that was there. I see Brenda Dubell, I see Beth Bovin. It's good to see you guys tonight. Good to see you, I guess you ladies so far. Oh, now we got a guy in the house, Robert Durbin. Good to see you, Robert. We can always count on you to join us on, on Tuesday evening. Glad you're here. If you didn't get the email yet, um, we're gonna do another uh, gather service um, this coming Friday. Just trying to do some small group opportunities for us to be back together in the same building. And um, you're welcome to come to that even if you did uh, come to the one on Sunday. Just going to do a few of those at different times and places. Uh, big hello to my good friend Greg Grizel, watching from Ohio. Shannon Saunders is on. Good to see you, Deacon Shannon. Thank you for being here. Julie Ash. Hey, Julie. Good to see you tonight. Glad you could log on. Hmm. Looks like we got a pretty good crowd going. Not like last week. You, no, I'm kidding. We've had good crowds every time. Same crowd most every week. Hey, let's do this. Let's pray together. We'll have a word of prayer as we begin the study time. And uh, we'll see who else might join us as we pray and, and then dive into the word for a story and a song. Father, thank you for this evening. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that even, and perhaps we should say especially, in challenging and difficult times, Lord, you are faithful. You are good. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is alive and it is active and it is doing the work that you intended it to do. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of, of just exploring your word. And I pray, Lord, that it would shape us, that it would form us, that you by your spirit would shape us. We just submit ourselves to you for this time, for this evening in particular, for those purposes. We praise you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see who else joined us there. Tracy Figueroa. Good to see you, Tracy. Hope you're doing well. Look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Hope the boys are doing well um, with you. I'm sure you're having fun at home with the crew. All right. Hey, let's go a little PG-13 tonight. Should we go PG-13? Let's talk David and Bathsheba. That's what's on my radar tonight. So, uh, Send the kids to bed because we're going rated PG-13 on the Bible. Um, just kidding about that. The kids are welcome to listen. I, we, won't get, we won't get too off color. Uh, I want to set this up as I do most, most evenings before we get into the actual text. Um, and <laughs> for those of you that were, were watching last week when I got my references all discombobulated, I'm almost positive that the verses I'm going to read to you first tonight are from 2 Samuel chapter 11. So you can, you can beat me there um, and wait for me. But before we do that, let's talk about stories and songs and just kind of remind ourselves of how they work. Um, the Bible, as we've said several times, is, is made up of all different types of literature. And just as in modern day, I can tell you a story or I can give you a, a historical narrative of something that happened, and that would be one way of explaining something to you. I could also sing you a song. Music is inspired by real events. Um, but music and or poetry, I kind of use the, the same terms there to refer to that. Um, music and or poetry is a very different way of telling a story. Stories and songs 
often are paired together in the Bible. We've, we've had a few where we read this story, and on the very next page, you can see a song that was written by one of the characters about their experiences in that story. But sometimes they aren't paired together. And so one of the things that I, I really hope to, to accomplish with this study, and I think we've done that, is to help you find some of the examples where this story from this part of the Bible actually can pair with this song not because their theme is the same, but literally because the song was written by one of the characters involved in the story about his or her experiences in that story. And so it's just a, a multi-layered way of helping us understand what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us. Remember, that's the point with all Bible verses, all Bible passages that we read is, these were inspired by the Holy Spirit. God wants me to know these words. And so why? Well, sometimes we get a story, but sometimes we get a song. And in these cases that we've been highlighting, we get stories and songs together that give us kind of a multi-layered approach to understanding why, why does the Holy Spirit want me to know this? And of course, uh, stories and songs are not the only two literary genres that we find in the Bible. There's all sorts of other things going on from from there's parts of the Bible that are just data driven, like census information or genealogies. Um, there's parts of the Bible that are prophetic, where prophets will write about visions, um, and and that's different uh, from from all. There's all kinds of genres in the Bible, but what we're doing specifically with these studies is finding a handful of examples where we can take one event and we can read a story about it, and we can hear the lyrics to a song that was written about or during it. Brenda Dukeson chiming in from Arizona. Good to see you, Brenda. Shout out to you and um, your family out there. Hope you guys are all doing well. Um, what I wanted to say before we get into the story tonight, um, I've, I've kind of enjoyed looking at these stories and songs, and each time I give one to you, I feel like there's a slightly different reason why the story and song are, are paired together. They, they do some different things. Sometimes the song amplifies the story. Sometimes it gives us details that weren't in the story uh, um, or, or vice versa. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, tonight, in the example we're going to look at, I, I feel like it's, it's this. Sometimes a song captures the emotion of a story without even really referencing the specific details of the story itself, without going back and telling us, you know, in verse one, this is what happened. And then verse two says, you know, here's what happened. And then in the chorus, we sing about, you know, how we feel about it or something like that. Songs can work that way, but sometimes they don't work that way at all. Sometimes they don't talk about the specific events. Um, the song's purpose might just be to give, to give words or to give expression to how we feel about a particular situation. Uh, and not so much to actually tell us what happened in that situation. And the result for that, those are, I think those have the potential to become, uh, when we're in a contemporary context, those are popular songs because the songwriter might have written it about circumstance A, and I've never experienced circumstance A, but I've experienced a different circumstance, but I have kind of the same emotions that the songwriter had about circumstance A. And so that song can kind of, sometimes we use this phrase, speak to me. It can speak to me in, in my circumstance. I can identify, maybe not with the story behind the song, but with the emotion that the song uh, brings to mind. The song can transcend the circumstances that, that gave it birth. And uh, when I was, you know, <laughs> thinking of a contemporary example of that, there's a, a million different ones where, you know, we have these beautiful, emotive songs, uh, but the circumstances behind them might not be immediately apparent. One of my favorites is Eric Clapton's hit from, from the early 90s. He wrote Tears in Heaven. Um, and if you know the song, you're probably familiar with the story behind the song. But my point is the song doesn't really reference the story at all. Uh, Eric Clapton wrote Tears of Heaven about the death of his four-year-old son, who actually fell from a high-rise window and, and died. And Eric wrote, wrote that song. I call him Eric, you know, because we're like that. We're on a first-name basis. Eric wrote the song. The song doesn't really describe um, the death of his son at all. It doesn't reference his son specifically. If you just picked up the song and didn't know the story behind it, 
you wouldn't really have any way of knowing. You, you would never in a million years know, oh, his son must have died. But the song is about the questioning pain that, that Eric went through. The song is about the sense of longing that he had to be reunited with his son. And all of those themes are, are overwhelmingly apparent when you hear the song. And they resonate with just about everybody. Just about anybody can, can think about a time in their life. Very often it, it might involve the passing of a loved one. But you can think about a time in your life when you felt that, that sense of longing that you just know is never going to be fulfilled this side of heaven. And, and um, yeah, you guys know the song. I'm, I'm going to choke it out here a cappella. But would you know my name? If I saw you in heaven, and would it be the same? If I saw you in heaven, he goes on and saying, I won't sing the whole thing, but a couple of lines that, that came to mind. In the bridge, he sings, time can break you down. Time can bend your knees. And time can break your heart and have you beg and please, beg and please. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you for the thumbs up on that. I appreciate whoever it was that sent that thumbs up. I'm honored. I'm honored. Maybe I'll do a, just a live session of me singing great hits a cappella later on. We'll have like nobody log in for that. Um, beautiful song though. And it, it transcends the specific story that it was written about. You don't have to have experienced the death of an infant to identify with those emotions. Uh, a lot of us could identify with those emotions. And if you like the song, chances are it reminds you of something or someone in particular. There's a million songs like that. Maybe you've got an idea of one that works the same way in your life. But that's just my little setup because I think the song we're going to look at tonight kind of does that. Um, but before we look at the song, let's look at the story. As I said, we're in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going rated PG-13 tonight because we're going to talk about David's affair with Bathsheba. Um, the background here, just real quick, David is king. Uh, we've been following, I've done several David stories and, and I'm kind of loosely following them chronologically. But, but we're, um, you know, David at this point is king. Um, and David was a wartime king. Israel was almost always picking a fight with somebody or having a fight picked with them. Uh, during David's reign. And at this point, he's in an ongoing war with their neighbors, the Ammonites. Um, but back in those days, they would take the winters off of, of war. They didn't go to war in the winter. So when the weather broke, um, and my understanding is for them, that meant rain, uh, more so more often than snow, though there is snow in the Bible. Um, but when, they, when the weather broke and, and, and they would take that time off, the, the, uh, everybody would go home and spend the winters at home. But then when the weather changed back into the spring months, typically warring nations would deploy their armies once again. It was kind of like halftime, you know, and then the whistle blows and it's time to play the second half. Um, and so we read right at the beginning of Second Samuel chapter 11 that it's been a time like that. It says, uh, and bear in mind, we have a narrator here. I'm just going to, I'm not going to get into authorship of, of the book of Second Samuel, it's irrelevant to our purposes and ultimately, um, you know, not not known to us. Um, so I'll just say the narrator. The narrator is telling us this story, and the narrator says, "In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah, which was a, a, an important city." Um, but David remained in Jerusalem. Uh, hey, quick hello to Sandra Miller. Good to see you. Sandra, you've been with us almost every week that we've, we've done a BE. You've been with us live. It's good to see you tonight. Um, I mentioned this is what the narrator says, because let's remember that ancient storytellers, not just biblical storytellers, but ancient storytellers on the whole, are not shy about giving us their opinion on things. Uh, they're going to insert commentary. Sometimes it's subtle commentary. Sometimes it's not remotely subtle. This one kind of falls in between because this narrator is, he's going to be um, almost a character in the story. The narrator is in this story because 
he's got these little commentaries all the way, and he starts off in verse 1 with a huge commentary. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David didn't. Um, it seems to be part of the narrator's agenda here that he wants to emphasize to us this whole story gets going, and it's, it's going to be a bad story. It's going to go south quick. This whole story gets going because David wasn't where he was supposed to be. David wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. David was in the wrong place at the right time, and it wasn't happenstance, it wasn't circumstance, it wasn't bad luck. It was because David made a bad choice. In the spring, in the time when kings go off to war, the king sent somebody else off to war. That's what the narrator tells us. Now, Joab was the commander of the armies. Let, let, let's measure that a little bit. It wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be unusual at all for the army commander uh, to, um, to, to, it wouldn't be unusual at all for the king to send the, the army commander out to war. That happened. But I think it's, it's, suspicious here that the narrator makes a point two different times of saying David was the king and yet he sent somebody off to war. I say two different times because look at the verse it ends with but David stayed in Jerusalem. It just feels a little obvious to me and so when I'm reading the Bible and I'm bearing in mind that ancient storytellers like to insert their little opinions in the story and that that was part of the Holy Spirit's plan. He inspired this ancient storyteller that always makes my spidey sense tingle a little bit, and I feel like um, uh, I feel like uh, you know there must be a reason for that. Hey, on my phone, I'm seeing a text from the Keeches saying they're having trouble joining us. So if anybody from the HRCC family uh, wants to text the Keeches and say yes, we are live, maybe they just need to refresh their page. I obviously can't do that and keep a straight thought here. But if you're on the HRCC family. Um, if you want to uh, help them out, you're welcome to do that. Verse 2. One evening David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So let's talk about this situation here because there's a few things going on here that are just subtle cultural issues. We got David up walking around on the roof of his his home, his palace. Don't think medieval castle here. It's just it's 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 his his ancient Near East home. It's probably the biggest home in the area, and it certainly serves his royal purposes. Um, but you know, it's not that he was on the roof of the castle. He's on the roof of his home and he's walking around in the cool of the evening, which would have been a very common thing for people to do. They did not have, of course, air conditioning. And it is, of course, a hot place to be. And so in the evening, when uh, the sun sets or is beginning to set and the evening breeze picks up, to be up uh, elevated on the roof is a very comfortable place to be. And so people oftentimes, my understanding, my research suggests they put rooms up there, sometimes even a little bedroom. It would be a great place uh, to just kind of rest and, and, and be safe and um, enjoy the cool of the evening. So David is doing what he probably has done a hundred other times. It's not unusual that he would be on the roof. Which begs the question, shouldn't Bathsheba have known that? If she also was going to the roof to take a bath, some have questioned, hmm, was she maybe a little bit of an exhibitionist? Was she doing something that perhaps she shouldn't have done? There's a few interesting questions about maybe what Bathsheba's motivation was here. I want to bring that up, and I hope you'll hear me out here because it's it's an issue that very quickly gets to um, the issues that we have in modern day with um, kind of the morality, maybe the better word to say is the immorality of, of, of sexual assault, because that's essentially what's going to take place here. Um, if I can just be blunt, some have asked the question, well, was Bathsheba asking for it? 
I think that we can't answer that question because we obviously don't know what was in her head. But here's the point I want to make. And I think this is a very relevant to today point to make. And so that's why I even went into this minefield here. Even if, even if it turns out that Bathsheba knew exactly what she was doing, even if she was a little bit of an exhibitionist, by taking her bath on the roof at a time of day when it would have been logical to assume there were other people within eyesight of her. Even if, and I don't know if that's the case, I don't think any of us could know if that's the case, but even if, did you hear me say that about 500 times? The narrator is never ever going to suggest that Bathsheba did anything wrong. He's never going to suggest that she should have known better. He's never going to suggest that she had it coming. The narrator consistently, consistently assigns 100% of the blame to David. And I think that's, that's worth recognizing in this story. We live in a culture that sometimes is going to be very quick to say it takes two to tango. And the narrator of this story, this is very much a story about guilt. The narrator of this story wants to make sure that we understand that David is 100% guilty and Bathsheba is not complicit at all. I think that's worth pointing out. Here's the other thing I want to point out about the couple of verses that I just read. Uh, it references that Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam and she's the wife of Uriah. Both Eliam and Uriah are members of David's bodyguard. Okay, that is important. In other words, Bathsheba's daddy and her husband are both close, trusted, um, you could use the word advisors. They're part of David's entourage. Now, to me, that raises some other questions. Bathsheba is the daughter and the wife of a couple of guys that David would have known very well. Also, Bathsheba's house is apparently very close to David's. It's within eyesight of, of the royal palace. So there's something suspicious about that. Doesn't it seem to you that he should have known who this was? Or maybe, as some have pondered or wondered, maybe he knew exactly who it was. There's something about this part of the story that just doesn't quite add up. He's sending to inquire about her. Let me read that again. David sent someone to find out about her. The narrator doesn't say what he wanted to find out. The person came back and, and gave him her name and said, oh, she's Bathsheba and here's who she's related to. But that seems to be information that David probably could have or would have already had. Look, I'm not trying to throw David under the bus here, but I'm a little bit trying to throw David under the bus here. <laughs> There's a lot in this story that says this, David was just wrong, wrong, wrong. And there's a lot of places in this story where the narrator makes that abundantly clear. He says it in black and white, David was wrong. But there's a lot of other places in this story where the narrator seems to insinuate and even about this, he was wrong. He was wrong, wrong, wrong. I just want to highlight those things. And again, I'm not telling you this is exactly how it went. I'm just saying there's some details here that are open to speculation. But the, the total weight of all of those details to me is overwhelming enough to say we cannot chalk this story. And I know many of you know exactly how this story goes. We cannot chalk this story up to an unfortunate set of circumstances where, oh, you know, it was just a, a coincidence and David, yeah, he did the wrong thing, but you know, oh, if he just never would have been on that roof, there's not, the narrator is not giving us a lot of room to excuse David's behavior. He's not really giving us any room to excuse David's behavior. Though David is clearly a, a, a Bible hero, a hero of the faith, um, in, in the totality of his life, we, we put him on the good guy side. Um, 
this story is a story in which there's really very little, there's very little that we can look at um, and find redeeming in his character. So let me go on. Where'd we leave off? I think I was uh, right at verse four. We just found out who Bathsheba is. So then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Again, like, you know, it just happens very quickly which seems to suggest that was his intent all along, right? This is not a one thing led to another and, you know, I just didn't see it coming and it wasn't where I wanted to be. No, David seems to have had this well planned out. She came to him and he slept with her. Uh, and then parenthetically, the narrator says to us, now she was purifying herself from her monthly unclean uncleanness is what the NIV says. I didn't know that was a word. Uncleanliness? I don't know. She wasn't clean. Okay? Uh, that's why she was bathing there. She was um, she was cleaning herself after her menstrual, menstrual cycle, which was certainly part physical, but also ceremonial. Um, the narrator is telling us that because later on when he describes that she's pregnant, it, it needs to be clear to us that there's really only one possible way that could have happened. So it says, then she went back home. Verse five says, the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. David knows he's in trouble here. And the narrator, as I said, is making it clear just so we know. There's no conspiracy theory here. There's really only one, one way that she got pregnant and David is to blame. I see Shirley Redford has joined us. Glad you could get with us tonight, Shirley. And Connie Meyer, who's been out of town, is back. Good to see you, Connie. Glad to have you here. I'm going to pick up the story. For those of you that are joining us late, we're in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11. And I am picking up the story in verse 6. So David sent this word to Joab. Remember, Joab is the commander of the army. Oh, it looks like the Keeches got in. Glad you guys could get here. And I see Cat Hall joining us as well. David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were and how the war was going. In other words, David made a lot of small talk about information that he really wasn't interested in at all, but he had to put on appearances, right? Verse eight, then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants, and he did not go down to his house. Okay? So, David realizes Bathsheba's pregnant. He panics. What am I going to do? Uh, her husband's away at war. Everybody knows he's away at war. So, he sends word to the army commander, send him back home. Let's get him 48 hours of leave so he can come home so that when this baby shows up, plausibly, people will of course, assume that everything's on the up and up and the baby belongs to him. Perhaps he will even assume that that's the case. So Uriah comes home, but he goes to the palace to report to the king, and David makes some small talk with him, and then says, you know, hey, you're home, why don't you go home? And I'll even send you a, a gift there. It doesn't say what the gift is, but you know, he sends him some chocolates and, and, and uh, champagne or something like that. And, um, then finds out after the fact that Uriah actually never went home. Uriah just slept in the foyer to the palace with the king's servants. There are a lot of cultural nuances in the verses that I just read that we know are kind of culturally charged. When I say that, I mean the kind of things that the original listeners would have just understood. We've talked about that before. The Bible is full of things like that, where, you know, idioms or or just references to places or ways of saying things that the people in that culture would have naturally understood. But here we are, and we don't understand them. But we're pretty sure that that means something. We just don't know what it means. Um, we don't know. For instance, was it common to call a soldier home? Did Uriah have a particular uh, standing or a particular job in the military that made that his job? It, did it raise suspicion? with folks that the king would have said, send me Uriah the Hittite? Um, we don't know. Maybe that was an ordinary thing, or maybe that right there, people were always already like, huh, why does David want to talk to him? Doesn't that seem a little weird? Um, we don't know. David says to him, uh, why don't you go wash your feet? 
that probably doesn't mean, hey, Uriah, I noticed your feet stink. Um, it probably means something else. It might be a way of maybe washing his feet was some sort of ceremonial way of saying, I'm done fighting for now. We know that there were religious consecrations that the men would take when they went into to battle. And maybe washing your feet was a way of, of removing yourself from that for a while so he could go home and just be a husband. Um, some have suggested that wash your feet was an innuendo for why don't you go visit your wife while you're home, um, which of course was David's, that was his purpose, though, his intent the entire time. The point is there's a lot here going on that, that we don't really, we don't know exactly what the narrator is implying, but we're pretty sure that he's trying to imply that David is still up to no good. David is being very purposeful. He is trying to... Uh, he's kind of the puppet master now, or at least he's trying to be. He's trying to arrange this scheme to cover his own sin. And everything the narrator is telling us from the beginning of the story to this point, he is just throwing David under the bus one line after another. Everything he says is framed in such a way to say, can you believe that King David, this man after God's own heart, was doing this? And then he was doing this, and then he was doing this, and he was just making it worse and worse and worse. So I'm going to pick up the story in verse 10. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, have you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark, referring to the ark of the covenant, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander, Joab, and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Now, I just want to highlight something here because, again, this is, this is subtle. But it, I love these Bible stories for these subtleties. Who is, who, who's the speaker here? It's Uriah. Well, what's Uriah's last name? He doesn't have a last name because people didn't. But it's, it's not just Uriah. It's Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite. What's a Hittite, you ask? The Hittites were a, a group of people that were, they were not Israelites. They were, they were a different ite. Um, the Hittites had had an empire. Um, they had had a kingdom. They had been very popular uh, in generations past. But the, the day of the Hittites was more or less over by the time um, this story takes place. In other words, Uriah is a foreigner. He's from a foreign land. He's, he's not an Israelite. Um, he, he's from a foreign land, and yet he has become not just an immigrant to Israel. We don't really know if immigrant's the right word. We don't know his backstory. But not just you know some sort of immigrant to Israel. He's become one of the king's most trusted men. Okay, He's honored in Israel. And look at what the narrator is saying. He doesn't call him... Uriah the Hittite for nothing, okay? Uriah is saying, I didn't go home because the ark is out at war. And he goes on to say, and my commander Joab and, and, and my, my buddies, you know, in the trenches and all of that. But notice that the first thing he references is the Ark of the Covenant. That is rich with irony. We talked about the Ark of the Covenant uh, was that last week or a couple of weeks ago? The Ark of the Covenant was was symbolic of, as the name implies, the covenant that God had with his people. And here we have a man that is not part of the covenant people, right? He's not an Israelite. He's a Hittite. Here we have a man who is not part of the covenant people, yet he has a greater commitment to the covenant than does David, the man who's supposedly in charge of the covenant people. Do you see the irony there? The narrator, I think, again, it can get lost on us if we just kind of buzz through the lines, but I think the narrator is actually purposefully trying to put this out, almost as if he was saying, and even the Hittite knew, I'm not going home and taking a break as long as God's covenant people are engaged in this battle. That's my place, not here. There's a deep, deep irony in David, as, as, um, 
you know, kind of the guardian or, or the human guardian or, or uh, commander of the covenant. That should have been his job. And he that's not on his radar at all. And yet the Hittite, the Hittite knew it. Let's move on. Verse 12. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I'll send you back. In other words, David's thinking, I got to try again. And what do you do if it doesn't work the first time? Well, you get the guy drunk. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. So it still didn't work. David's scheming is not working. And look at this. Again, Just I got, I got to say it again. The narrator is going out of his way to highlight Uriah's virtue. Uriah's virtue and his honor, and at the same time, he's emphasizing David's guilty schemes. Verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, and he sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. This is um, interesting because we've just escalated the story. David's guilty of at least adultery. If not, we potentially could frame it as, as assault, right? We can presume Bathsheba um, didn't have a, an actual say in the matter. Um, the narrator certainly frames it that way. We've gone from there to now he's, he's guilty of planning another man's murder. But it's actually even worse than that. David had sent Joab a specific plan. You know, put Uriah on the front lines where the fighting is fiercest and then just command a retreat, only don't tell Uriah about it. That was David's plan to get um, Uriah dead. Uh, to get Uriah dead, to kill Uriah. Um, but that plan, I think Joab here feels like, well, that would be kind of obvious to everybody there. Like that plan is not going to fly. And so it kind of looks, it kind of looks like Joab's covering for David. Joab's like, I got a better idea. This is going to be less obvious. And so he kind of does that. But look at, the reason I say that is because the narrator emphasizes, he doesn't say, um, uh, it says, Joab put Uriah in a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. It doesn't say anything about a retreat there. It doesn't say, it looks like Joab didn't actually execute David's plan. He came up with kind of a better plan that would look a little bit less suspicious and more plausible from a military standpoint. But here's the point. It cost the lives of even some more soldiers. See, David was just thinking, we, we got we to gotta kill Uriah. And Joab's like, there's no way to do that and, and not have everybody asking questions. Uh, and that's not going to end well. So Joab executes a similar plan, but a little bit different, that won't be quite as suspicious. But it costs the lives of, of some innocent men here. I think that's, that's noteworthy. Verse 18, Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Okay, that's a known bad tactic. That's a bad military tactic. Don't go right up to the city. Try and draw them out. Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know that they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerobesheth? I almost got through that. Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Wink, wink. Okay? So Joab knows when this report goes back, David's going to question Joab's military technique here. 
Um, and he even references a story from Israelite history. Uh, Abimelech is a, one of the judges. He's the son of, they give a different name there, but we know him better as Gideon's son. You could go back and read the story of Abimelech and how he died fighting at the foot of, of a, a walled city when a woman dropped a millstone on him. Uh, that's in Judges chapter 9 if you wanted to go read that backstory. Um, Joab's like, I did this thing. It wasn't exactly what David told me to do. And I have a feeling when he hears about it, he's going to be ticked. So he tells the messenger, and if you notice the king getting ticked, make sure to make this clear that Uriah is dead. You know, and there's kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge there. Joab, um, I'm not trying to paint Joab as a hero here, but just part of the story here is that Joab is willing to risk his professional reputation in order to cover for David. Joab covered for David a lot. Joab would do a lot of David's dirty work for him. Um, but in this case, Joab's willing to risk his reputation. Joab has a great reputation as a brilliant military commander and a brilliant military strategist. And he's willing to risk that by doing something foolish on the battlefield but he's kind of subtly saying, make sure the king knows why I did this foolish thing. It was to cover for him. And presumably the messenger has no idea what's actually going on. Verse 22, the messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And David, you know, you can kind of see him like getting angrier and angrier, and then hearing the last part. Oh, oh, okay. So David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. K Sirah Sirah. It doesn't say that. Well, maybe in the message translation, but not here. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. Oh man, I wanna I wanna smack David in the mouth. Say this to encourage Joab. He's such a rascal here. He knows Joab doesn't need encouragement. But he's like he's patronizing, is what he's doing. Oh, Poor Joab, he came up with a plan and some men died. I mean, uh, say this, it's okay, Joab, but David's the one. David's the one who's behind all this, all this nonsense. Verse 26, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Now, so here's something I don't know. <laughs> I've been saying a lot of things I don't know. But here's something I specifically don't know. It seems likely to me that people would have been suspicious of this child's parentage when the child is finally born. The Bible doesn't give us a specific timeline here, but uh, we know that David had his, um, his evening with Bathsheba and that after that, she would have found out that she was pregnant, probably not the next day. They didn't have uh, instant pregnancy tests at Walgreens at that point. So some time would have elapsed. And then he called Uriah home. And then, but Uriah didn't spend any time with her. And then Uriah had to go back to the battlefield. And then Uriah died. And then there's a period of time where Bathsheba has to go through the traditional mourning. And it's not until after that that David marries her. So I don't know the timeline, the precise timeline of all those events, but it seems likely to me that this baby is born not nine months after David and Bathsheba are married, but maybe more like seven months or perhaps even less. And although there weren't... Um, you know, obstetrics was not a career that I'm aware of in the time of King David. I think they knew enough about how to calculate how much uh, time that babies spent in the womb that when that baby came, I'll bet that at least in the palace, if not on the streets of Jerusalem, there were a few people going, 
huh, that doesn't seem to add up. But in the story, nobody ever says anything to David. And that makes sense to me because nobody ever says anything to the king. Nobody's going to question him. And if the story were to end there, it kind of seems like even if the truth is out there, sounds like I'm doing the X-Files now, right? Even if the truth is out there, David being the king has once again used his power to get what he wants. And nobody's going to ask him a question. And so he's prepared to go on with the rest of his life and just not feel that guilt anymore. That seems to be David's plan. But that's not God's plan. And so we turn the page to chapter 12 and read just the last chunk of this story. The Lord sent Nathan, who was a prophet operating at the time, Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, it drank from his cup, and it even slept in his arms. And they gave it a name. It sounds like a pet, right? A family pet. That's exactly the scenario there. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, and he prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. A little background here. Um, in just I didn't know this off the top of my head, but did a little bit of study. Paying for the lamb four times over is actually what the law would have been. If you steal uh, livestock uh, and you're caught, you have to pay back quadruple whatever you stole. So that's the right sentence. David knows the sentence and he, he, he gives the proper sentence. But he also says, oh yeah, and we're going to kill the guy too because he's just that despicable. David is so incensed about this story that he supports capital punishment. Have you ever noticed how people tend to have their most visceral responses to the very things that they feel most guilty about? There's not a small amount of psychology going on in this story. And Nathan, a prophet who's clearly speaking on behalf of God, clearly inspired by the Holy Spirit, is, is working through that psychology, knowing if I tell David this story, he's going to have this knee-jerk gut reaction, but it's it's actually coming from his awareness of his own guilt. So verse 7, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. The guy that you just said should die, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, as, as if he's saying in the context of that other story, I gave you all the sheep and cattle you could ever want, right? And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Parenthetically, that's exactly what happens to David um, when there's a, um, a threat on his kingdom from his son Absalom. And then later on when the kingdom is translating, uh, transitioning rather to Solomon, there's another power struggle there among his sons and they're in in, a, in an effort to try and um, consolidate their own authority and their power they're taking David's concubines as their own and it's you know for the purposes of this story we have to set aside the moral issue of David even having multiple wives and concubines but the point is that 
what David did in secret, God saying part of the judgment upon you is that uh, I'm going to see that the same thing happens to you in broad daylight in front of all of Israel. And that's exactly what happens. Like I said, we're kind of setting aside a lot of moral stuff there, not because it's not important, but for the purposes of this story and song, God has now pronounced his judgment over David's sin. And I think the question is, how is David going to respond? How is David going to respond? He's finally been caught. Um, Boy, how do leaders respond when they're confronted with their own guilt? Uh, I think in modern experience, we find that they don't often respond very well. It seems like there's usually an excuse or a cover-up or some other way of trying to dodge the blame or the guilt. How is David going to respond? Well, verse 13, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. There's David's response. You, you, you've been confronted. You see what's happened. What are you going to do, David? And David acknowledges, I sinned. I did it. And that's where I'm going to stop reading the story. Now, there's more to this story, or the story has, has other chapters. It goes on to describe, if you're familiar with it, you'll remember that, you know, the, the, the baby is born and um, stricken with an illness and, and ultimately dies. Um, there's a lot going on here, but what I want to focus on is what is David's response? David has done not one bad thing. Um, it's not a situation here where David made a mistake, right? We're very quick in our culture to excuse people who made a mistake. The narrator doesn't want to give us that option with David here. He didn't make a mistake. David schemed and he planned and he did one evil thing after another, after another, after another. And when he was worried that he might get caught, he came up with some schemes to cover his earlier schemes. And he just kept going and he just kept digging. And there was nothing about what he did that wasn't sinful. That's what the narrator wants us to see and know about all of this. And finally, finally, David is confronted. How is he going to respond when he can't escape his own guilt? And the story tells us that he responds by saying, I have sinned against the Lord. But I leave that to you and say there's not really a lot of information there. I don't feel like that one line gives us very much insight. Um, I kind of am hungry to know, well, well, what does that mean? Like, how did that impact his spiritual life? Um, he obviously had to move forward. Like, you know, the sun is going to rise tomorrow. But, but how did what happened affect his relationship with God? How did that change his relationship with God? How did he navigate that? Isn't that where the real meat of this story ought to be? I, I would presume um, and, and hope that not too many of us could identify with a part of walking around a, a roof and seeing a beautiful woman and having her husband killed so we could have her for ourselves. That's not a story that's going to be very directly identifiable to most people. But a story about being confronted with our own sinfulness and our own guilt and recognizing our own uh, wretchedness and running out of excuses and running out of any way of saying there's validation for that and just being confronted with the weight of it, that's a story I can, I can identify with. And so teach me here, David. Let me learn from your story. What does that feel like? What does that look like? And we get to verse 13, and, and we really don't get very much. It's David saying, I have sinned against the Lord. As I say, if you keep reading there, you're going to read that not only do we have trouble gauging David's emotional and spiritual well-being or response at this point, we're not the only ones who are having trouble kind of figuring out where David's at. His own household and his own servants were not real sure what to do with David at that point. Is David good? Is he bad? Is he going to fly into a rage? Is he going to go into a depression? They didn't know what to do with him either. And so the story is not going to give us the answers that we're looking for. But luckily for us, David wrote a song because that's what David did. And his song is included in scripture. So here's where I'm going to ask you to turn the pages in your Bible to the Psalms. And we're going to go to Psalm 51. And this song is the real window to his response to this sin. 
I want to just pause and again, I, I want to frame this, you know, what I'm, what I'm imagining or what I'm picturing. I, I want to try and share that with you. Uh, do you know people, are there people in your life um, that just don't emote or they don't emote in a way that's easy to interpret or understand? Uh, we, we have euphemisms for like the strong silent type, but sometimes that silent type, you know, if you're around somebody like that and they're clearly going through something, but they're not letting on how they're feeling or how they're processing or what they're doing, that those can be frustrating situations. That's how the Bible describes what was going on with David following this incident. And so the story is, well, he, he walked around and he, he didn't have a whole lot to say. And uh, he was mourning and he was grieving. And, you know, of course, he was on the verge of losing his own son, but uh, he wasn't an easy guy to talk to at that time. And we weren't quite sure what to expect from him. That's the story. The song is going to give us insight into what was really going on with him. So Psalm 51 begins with this heading. I've told you this before. These headings are original biblical text. They don't have verse numbers, but they are original biblical text. So they're important to look at. It says, this is a song for the director of music. It's a Psalm of David. And it occurred when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So it, 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 it's right there. We know exactly what this song is about. And, um, we can pin it to the story with absolute certainty. Here's the song that David writes. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions and wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I'm going to pause there. Three verses. And I feel like it's, it's just a straightforward prayer of confession and a plea of forgiveness. Um, David doesn't say, here's what I did. He doesn't go back into the story. I'm not suggesting that that's not a necessary part of confession sometimes. I'm just highlighting what this particular song says. Have mercy on me. Any of us could sing that song or use that song, appropriate that song in our prayers. It's not specific to the situation. It, this is just what confession looks like. Remember early on when at the beginning of our class tonight, I referenced um, songs that, that give us insight into emotional processing without really going through the details of the story themselves um, and, and how those songs can become useful or identifiable for, for people in a variety of situations. That's why I brought that up because here we have David writing this song just saying, God, you have to forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Verse 4. Here's where we're going to get interesting. Against you, God, and you only have I sinned. I got to tell you, I have always struggled with that line. I, I find that to be one of the most interesting lines in all of Scripture. Against you and you only have I sinned. And part of me wants to say, really? Just, just God. Just God. What about Uriah? Feel like you sinned against Uriah. What about Bathsheba? What about the other dead soldiers that lost their lives because Joab was trying to cover for you? I feel like from my perspective, my human perspective of what justice looks like, I could come up with a fairly exhaustive list of people that David has sinned against. And yet, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes in verse 4, to God, addressed to God, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. That's a really, really intriguing statement. But let me finish the line and give you what insight I can into that. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict and you are justified when you judge. Here's the theology. And we talked about this with a lot of things. These songs are not just songs. They're, they're theological statements. They're statements about God um, and, 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 and so there's, there's theology here to extract from them and understand. And the theology here is this. David seems to be telling us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that all sin at its root is a transgression of our covenant relationship with God. I think if we pinned David down and said, you know, don't you think you treated Uriah wrongly? I think David would say, well, of course I treated Uriah wrongly. But the basis of all sin 
is a transgression of my covenant relationship with God. It's when I, and, and if I could use different words to explain that rather than transgression, covenant relationship, what, what I mean by that, it's when I act in a way that is not consistent with the way that God has created me to act. All sin finds that at its basis. And so if that's the basis of sin, then confession has to start from that same place. Should we confess our sins to other people? Well, yeah, the Bible says we should. Should we ask forgiveness of people that we have harmed? Absolutely, the Bible says we should do those. But David here, and I think we could look at other scriptures that would reinforce this, David here is saying, let's do that and also recognize that the very nature of sin is that it is a foundational transgression against God. God is the, um, God is the offended party when we sin. Look at what he says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That's a, it's not just a theological statement, that's a philosophical statement there. Who other than God is the one who could determine evil from good? Where else but from God do we get a moral compass? Um, these are, uh, not to get lost in really deep philosophical weeds here, but this is the basis of some of the inherent problems with atheism. If there is no God, then who's to say that Hitler was a bad man? If there is no God, then who's to say that right is right and wrong is wrong? There's, there's philosophical fallacies with that, if not God as the purveyor of wrong and right. And so David is saying, look, the issue here isn't that I did something that embarrassed the kingdom. The issue isn't that I did something that was against one of the ordinances we have down at City Hall. The issue here isn't that I did something that's likely to tick off Uriah's family. The issue is that I did, God, what is evil in your sight? It was, it was your rule that I transgressed, no one else. And because of that, he says, so you are right in your verdict. God, when you say, when you say I am wrong, you're right about that. You are justified. In other words, you are made right when you act in judgment against me because it was your rule in the first place. There's just a lot, a lot going on there, and I wanted to highlight that. Look, oh, man, you thought there was a lot going on there. Look at verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. I think these are really, really important verses to understand the nature of sin. And there's a lot of theology about this. And, and not every pastor, not every Christian leader, not every theologian, and not every Christian would state this precisely the way that I would state this. But, you know, I, my, my job here is to tell you how, how I believe the, the scriptures are shaping us. And, and here, I think this is important. Surely I was sinful at birth. David is making, again, a theological statement. And he's saying, you know, I don't know about David's culture, but in our culture, we have this idea that babies are born innocent. Like, we even use that word. Look at how innocent she looks, you know, about a newborn baby. Um, and David is pushing back against that idea and saying, look, not only are we born sinful... Uh, he, he's saying, I, I was sinful from, from the first moment that I existed, from the moment of my conception. Um, you desired faithfulness even in the womb. Uh, God, you, you, were, you were recognizing the gulf between you and I even before I was born. Look, that is important. That is a really important thought for us in the way we think about sin in this world. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, that there are a lot of people in the world, and in the church for that matter, and on this issue I believe they're wrong, that think about sin in terms of the naughty things that we do. And that's just not how the Bible talks about sin. The Bible talks about sin, yeah, you can commit a sin, and that would be a, a naughty thing that you would do, but the real issue with sin is the condition that we were born into. The condition that we were born into. Here at HRCC, I've used the analogy sometimes about infected soil. 
we live on infected soil and there's just nothing that we as individuals can do about it. It's the condition uh, that we were born into. And here's why that's important. When we have conversations and or debates with people about is this particular behavior a sinful behavior or not, very often those who would say it is not a sinful behavior would do so on the basis of I was born this way. Now, if you hear those words, you probably go right to uh, the LGBTQ conversations, right? And the issues around is the homosexual lifestyle uh, allowable according to God's plan. And the pushback from the gay community very often against those who would say, no, it's not. The pushback often is, but I was born this way. How would, could God create me to be a way that I'm not supposed to be? But I think that argument has, it's, or is, is found in many more places than just the conversation or the discussion or the debate about the gay lifestyle. I think it, it, it comes up in all sorts of ways, sometimes even in silly ways. Like, I lose my temper a lot. And you know, oh, well, I'm Irish. Can't get the Irish out of me. You know, which is kind of a tongue-in-cheek way of saying, but I was born this way. It's just the way I am. And David's here saying, check this out. You were not born the way God created you. You were sinful at your birth. Okay, to, to be particular about it, David's saying, I was sinful by my birth. But I think he's giving us a theological point that we need to bear in mind. We need to recognize that the human condition from beginning to end, is one that has been marred and impacted by sin. And so what we see, whether it's a birth issue or not, but what we see as natural, what we see as logical, this impacts the way we even think about justice. How would a good God, you know, send people to hell? How would a loving God send people to hell or create a hell or, or you know, however you want to think about that question? When we ask those questions, part of the problem is we're approaching them from a sinful, fallen sense of justice. And David's like, man, I was dealing with sin before I was dealing with oxygen. Before I was even born, sin has marred my character. Sin has impacted who I am. And the, um, the impact of that truth, I think, is something that we just... we. Um, we can't overestimate. It's, it's everywhere. I need to move on. Verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Hyssop was a particular kind of branch used actually in ceremonial washing sometimes. Um, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Here's what's going on here. David recognizes that the keeper of the covenant is the only one who has the ability to cleanse when that covenant has been broken. There's no other resource that we can go to address our guilt. This is part of the gospel, right? The world asks, or has this idea of God is angry, like, don't get God angry. You know, if he's angry, man, are you in trouble then? Like, don't sin, he might throw a lightning bolt. But David has a very, very different understanding of God. David, when he sins, he runs to God. He doesn't run away from God. He runs to God because he knows that when sin has um, fractured my relationship with God, when sin has damaged my relationship with God, there's only one being that can repair it, and it's God. So I shouldn't run away from him because I'm scared of him. I should run to him because I trust him. He's the one who's going to cleanse me. He's the one who's going to wash me. He's the one that's going to return joy and gladness to my life. He's the one who's going to make me rejoice. He's the one who's going to take care of this sin problem. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David, I was reading these tonight, and I just scribbled the word born again. He's got a born again theology here. He's recognizing that the work of confession is a restorative work in our lives. Uh, I think sometimes we have this idea that when we confess, 
the person that we confess to, and this might be true in human interaction, but we, we carry it over to God. We confess to God and God's like, all right, I'll forgive you this one time, but let me tell you what, I got my eye on you, sucker, and if you so much as get this far out of line, you're going to hear it from me. That's our image of what confession looks like. And David has a very different image of confession. He has this image that involves rebirth. He uses the word renew. Um, he, he talks about these, these words, restoration. There's, it, it sounds like born again. Now, he doesn't use the word born again, but I, I scribbled that word because it, it made me think, of, wow, that's what it means to be born again, to be forgiven, to be restored. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Do we hear where this is going? Like this awful, terrible story. And the song that begins with, have mercy on me, God, I need your forgiveness. But where, where does that forgiveness lead us to? This is a word of hope. I've already used the word restoration, but we, we hear like this, this praise welling up from within David. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Think about that imagery. I've been caught in sin, egregious sin. Open my lips, Lord, and you'll hear me excuse myself. Open my lips, Lord, and you'll hear me complain that it wasn't my fault. Open my lips, Lord, and you'll hear me scream out and cry so that maybe you won't throw a lightning bolt at me. Nope. Nope. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Like, there's just been this, 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 this arc to, to David's understanding of his relationship with God. We didn't get that in the story, did we? But we're, we're hearing what's really going on with him. Let's finish the song. Verse 16, you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous in burnt offerings made whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Interesting lines there, and I just close with these thoughts. David's referring to the ceremonies of what you would do in Old Testament days um, to, uh, to address your guilt. He's referring to those, and he's mixing in there these lines about prospering Zion and building up the walls of Jerusalem. And that all sounds like very formal. But can we remember who David is? Zion is his home. Jerusalem is his home. Um, and more so than just being his home, it's his divine responsibility. And so while that sounds like very formal language and, uh, you know, we, we might be like, oh, so when I confess sin, I'm supposed to pray for Jerusalem? Like, I don't think that's the takeaway at all here. I think David's saying when I'm restored, when I'm restored, God, you can once again do the work that you plan to do through me all along. I think that's a powerful word of hope. And maybe tonight if, if I can... I, if I can preach for a minute here, I want the musicians to come back up on the stage and we're going to have an altar call here, right? Maybe tonight, if you're hearing this story and you have been um, feeling crippled by guilt or you're dealing with the weight of some of those things, um, like, you know, I kind of jokingly said, I don't know that we can identify with the specifics of David's story, but I feel like all of us can find a verse in his song, Right? And I feel like maybe this is your verse here. God, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I go to church. I do the things I'm supposed to do. Sacrifice, burn offerings. I go through the religious process of dealing with this. But I'm worried that that's not the right thing to do. Listen to what David's saying here. He's saying, it's not the religious process that gets us there. It's the restorative work that God does in our hearts. The restorative work that God can do in a contrite heart is such that the work God planned for you, the things God has in mind for you, 
are still valid. Submit yourself to him. Bring yourself to him in confession. And come away from that confession knowing that he still desires to do his good work in your life. The Old Testament talks about the God who repays for the years that the locusts have eaten, right? And I think that's the heart of what David is getting at here. May it please you to prosper Zion. That's, that's a very, for David alone, that's a very personal way of saying, God, build my house. Build my house as you build your house. Can I just pray that over each one of you tonight? Father, I... I give words to what I believe is on many of our hearts. That the truth is we, we are deeply aware of our own brokenness and our own sinfulness. We are deeply aware of the ways in which we have um, transgressed the covenant that you have with us. And Father, even as I say that, we confess that sometimes we aren't aware. We don't know. Or we think we've dealt with it, as David thought perhaps he had dealt with it, until your word came to him through Nathan. So we submit ourselves to your word tonight. And I pray, Lord, that as we confess to you, first, God, I want to pray that you would remind us by your love that we need not run from you and we would be better served by running to you. And as we run to you, as we acknowledge, as David acknowledged, against you and you alone have we sinned. God, you are right about this. When you judge, you are just in the way you judge. You're right. As we do that, Lord, I pray that your restorative work would begin in our hearts, in our lives. And I pray for those who would hear these words tonight and maybe have questioned, is God done with me? Is God through with me? I pray, Lord, as David prayed for himself, that you would build their walls, that you would prosper their city, and that the plans that you have for them would proceed according to your good purposes for their lives. I thank you, Lord, for that grace and that mercy, which we can know to count on from you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, I see a late entry there from Nancy Larson. Go hug Haley for us. We're missing both of you. Candy Blank, Jackie Korea, good to see you guys. Thanks for checking in. Many of the rest of you, um, you know, if you didn't catch the whole thing, it'll be posted on our Facebook page as always within a few moments. And if there's somebody else that you wanted to let know who isn't on Facebook, um, most likely by sometime Wednesday, tomorrow, it'll be on our YouTube channel uh, and they can study along with this story and song. Look forward to seeing you right here next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Good night, everybody.